this is going way back, but the upper valley is in there. The, when we arrived in Spain, we carried too much with us, even though we thought at the time that we were only going to be spending a year. I, car I carried things like a, a small anvil. I had no oh idea what I was going to do <laughs> with an anvil. We came over by boat, so it wasn't by plane. So we really, when we got off that boat and we put our luggage down, we realized it was impossible. Mm -hmm. And so we decided what, the only way we would ever get around was we'd buy a car. Mm -hmm. And so we went to that duty-free port, which was Gibraltar. And in Gibraltar, we bought a Volkswagen. Mm -hmm. We put all our luggage in it, and we set off, crossed the border from Gibraltar into Spain. And when we crossed the border, we realized there was something different about our car. A Gibraltar plate is black with white letters. A Spanish plate is white with black letters, just the opposite. And as we crossed the border, Franco, the time he was in power, decided they wanted Gibraltar back. And the way they would get it back would be to make the people from Gibraltar suffer as much as possible. <laughs> and so here we were driving off in, in, into Spain with our very noticeable Gibraltar plates, and the police were giving us a, really, we'd be stopped by civil guards and, and harassed and everything. We realized we had to get rid of these plates. And we wound up, we found this place in Catalonia on the coast, and we realized that we would be able to make enough money to continue staying there. And I said, well, look, one of the first things we have to do is get rid of these Gibraltar plates. We'll never <laughs> be able to live here in peace. And I went and found out how much would it cost to import the car into Spain so as to get Spanish plates. And they told me the duty on Gibraltar cars was 100%. That means we'd have to buy the car all over again. Oh my God. And I said, gee, that would be impossible. But I had a friend and he said, well, you're an American. Why don't you put American plates on your car? <laughs> and I said, well, wait a second. You have to live in the place to get it. He said, no, no. I know that there are two states that send license plates all over the world, no questions asked. Really? He said, one is Alabama. And I just couldn't put on my car a plate that had the symbol Heart of Dixie. And the other was Vermont. And my wife and I had never been to Vermont. I mean, I knew Vermont, it was sort of north of New York, but I had never been to Vermont. But I wrote to them, and I, in order to sweeten the, the situation, I said to them, I'm an ex-Vermont, complete lie, I'm an ex-Vermonter, I'm now living in Europe, I'd like to put Vermont plates on my car. And they wrote back a wonderful letter, and they said, oh, we feel so proud that you feel such a loyalty to your state. I mean, it was tongue in cheek, a loyalty to your state. Send $27. I sent the $27, and there my green Vermont plates arrived, took off my Gibraltar plates, put on the Vermont That's plates. That's a great story. I love that story. Drove all around Europe with Vermont plates, never having been to Vermont. <laughs> but of course, we traveled in Europe and we'd reach places and be in towns and people who knew Vermont Americans, and they'd come up to us and they'd say, you're from Vermont. We had no idea who they were. We said, oh, yes. They said, where are you from? And the only place I knew, I said, Montpelier. <laughs> and they said, how lucky you are. It's such a beautiful state. You're really lucky to live there. And in driving around as false Vermonters, we were told how wonderful and how lucky we were to be living or to have that connection with Vermont. It's a great story. So the time was we decided it was time to come back to the States. And I could, we could live anywhere as artists. <coughs> we could, and the logical thing, again, <clears throat> both of us with a New York connection, would be to come and to stay in New York. But unfortunately, with small children, I could not imagine coming back <clears throat> in a... Uh, and having them say, we were artists, we could not live in some fancy neighborhood, who knew what their education would really be. And we had a friend who had lived in Spain for a while and had come back and was living in Vermont. And I got in touch with him, just coincidentally, and said, you know, I think that a Vermont would be a place, again, never having been in Vermont. He said, uh, uh, are you serious about coming back? And I said, yes, and he was in real estate. And offhandedly, I said, look, if you find a place let us know. We were living in Spain, and within three weeks, I got a letter from him saying, Roy, I found just the place for you. It's a house with a barn, a studio. <laughs> Wonderful. The people are selling. You have to come back now. And I said, gee, my bluff has been called. Either we're really going to do something or not. And so I flew back. My wife stayed with the children in Spain. I flew back. I landed in New York. I got on a bus. I had with me my heaviest... Spanish clothing. <laughs> I took the bus up to White River Junction. I 
got out of the bus, stepped out. It was 20 <laughs> degrees below zero. I couldn't breathe. I said, people can't live. So I was ready to get back on the bus, you know. But the friends met me. We went out that evening. I, I think I shivered all evening. But the next morning, they took us to see the Norwich, actually. And it was, I mean, being in New Yorker, for me, snow was essentially slush. Here was snow white, just as you see it in the movies. It was beautiful. It was a sunny, crisp day. And they took us to the Marion Cross School and walked into the school. And it was, I went to a New York City school in the Bronx. Here it was what one dreamt of what education should be. There were pegs on the wall, and the children's coats were hung there, and their boots were lined up, and mufflers were there. And I looked out the door, and there was a, they had frozen part of the field, and the kids were ice skating. And I spoke to the teachers, and they said, I said, you know, my children. <coughs> Edit. <coughs> sorry. <coughs> sorry, go. OK, now, back to the school, Mary Cross. I'm sorry. And uh, I spoke to them, and they said, I said, you know, my children speak. They can read and write Catalan and Spanish. It was required in this school. But we thought to have them learn to read and write English would be a little bit too hard for them. But they have spoke English. Have them learn and read and write English? English would be too hard. I mean, they were going to school in a school that spoke Spanish sure, and sure, Catalan. Sure. They spoke English perfectly, mm -hmm. but we felt, gee, to, to have them come home, and it was one of these schools that gave you lots of homework and stuff, to have them also try to learn to read and write English. So we said, look, my daughter was eight or nine. Uh, she doesn't, she can't read or write. And they said, don't worry, we'll give her special, we won't leave her behind. It just sounded so wonderful. And we decided to take that plunge. Again, it meant buying a house, which was, a, again, a commitment because we had no security. Uh, we had, uh, it happened to be a fortunate time. I, um, we had done well, and so we had the money, but we had no idea in three years or five years whether we'd be able to do it. But we bought the house and came back to Norwich and lived here. My children were brought up here, and, and actually, this is, this is their home, though, of course, the sad thing happens is, is that your children go off. I mean, uh, uh, my daughter is in New York City working as a, an executive in a, in a big uh, perfume company, and my son is in Washington, D.C., working in the British Embassy.